Okay, so friends, here's what I want to do for the next little while. I want to talk about something that I think is a theme running through Sefer Devarim. And the theme that's running through Sefer Devarim, one of the many themes that's running through Sefer Devarim, as a book that is essentially about Moshe, the man who brought the Jewish people to Sinai, telling them what life is going to be like when they get to Zion, when they get to the land of Israel, which he's not going to go to. In a certain sense, I think you find over and over again in Sefer Devarim, discussions about the relationship between what I'm going to call Brit Sinai, the covenant of Sinai, and Brit Zion, the covenant of Zion. Now, let me define what I mean by each of those. First of all, what I will say is that I didn't come to the idea that there is within the Jewish people's relationship with God as a covenant, that there are really two covenants, one that is about Sinai and one is about Zion on my own. I read this beautiful book about 10 years ago called Sinai and Zion by John Levinson, who's a Bible scholar who teaches at Harvard. And the book really, it really changed my life actually, because what he basically posits is he says, look, we have a thread running through Tanakh that is about God's relationship with the Jewish people being based on the revelation at Sinai, being based on mitzvot, being based on Torah. We also have a theme, a thread running through Tanakh that discusses the fact that, or that discusses a suggestion that God's relationship with the Jewish people is very much through this place called Zion. And not just this place, but specifically a dynasty that rules over this place, Mahut Beit David, the Davidic dynasty. And that also seems to be another locus of the covenant between God and the Jewish people. And the question that he really had from the beginning is how do we understand these two covenants? What do they each have to say? And what's the relationship between them? And so when we're going to talk today about Brit Sinai, the covenant of Sinai, of God revealing God's self and the Torah at Sinai to the Jewish people, and the covenant of Zion, of God promising the land of Israel, to the Jewish people, the land of Canaan, and later the land of Israel, to the Jewish people, we're really actually looking at two aspects of a relationship that in some ways are flip sides of the same coin, but in being flip sides of the same coin, they actually sometimes not just complement each other, but sometimes they also are in tension with each other. And I wanna see a little bit of that today, okay? So far so good? So I'm going to take us through a few psukim that I think really epitomize what Brit Sinai is all about, and a few psukim that really epitomize what Brit Zion is all about. And I want us to see what's ma'afian, what characterizes each of these. If you want a source sheet, Uri, there's uh, right in front of you, if you want, okay? So let's look at the first time that we actually meet Sinai as a place, and that is at the beginning of Sefer Shemot. Number one, okay? If, uh, for the purpose of the recording, maybe it makes sense for me to read, right? I think I'm gonna do that. So let's see, right? For the purpose of the recording? Okay, great. So we're just in Shmo Perakimel. No revelation at Sinai has happened yet. And yet we get this introduction to Sinai or to Chorev, as it's called here, that I think really tells us something about what Brit Sinai is gonna be about. So we have Perakimel, Pasuk Aleph, so Moshe is tending to the flock of Yitro. And he drove the flock into the wilderness. And he comes to Chorev, which is the mountain of God. So let me ask you a question. What do you notice first about Chorev? What info is this Pasuk giving us, first and foremost, about Chorev the other name for Sinai. What does it tell us? It's approachable. It's approachable. Why do you think it's approachable? He just chanced upon it. He chanced upon it. Okay. It's in the wilderness. It's in the wilderness, which, already- right? Meaning you're already giving a, a judgment to it's approachable, right? But if it's in the wilderness, maybe you can't find that same spot twice, maybe, mm-hmm. right? Meaning, so it's not clear, 
but yeah, so he kind of stumbles upon it. It's in the wilderness. It was known as the mountain of it's God. known as the mountain of God. It's fertile for the sheep. It's something, it's, it's graze worthy, right? When I look at this Pasuk, I say to myself, is this place in Midian? I don't know. It doesn't describe it as being within the precincts of Midian at all. It says, oh, we went out into the wilderness and it's God mount, God's mountain, maybe because the omniscient narrator can call it God's mountain or maybe because people know it as God's mountain. It's described as a place that's kind of outside of human, both habitation and human sovereignty, right? It doesn't tell us, right? Who's in charge of this place? Well, it's God's mountain. Sounds like God's in charge of this place, right? Are there humans who rule over this? Is this some prince's backyard? It's not the way it's described. It's described as radically free, other, outside of human habitation and human politics. Let's keep going. And what happens? A angel of God appears in a fire from within this bush. And it turns out that this bush, it's on fire, but it's not consumed. Give me a second thing that you learn about Sinai here. Supernatural. Supernatural, right? It's not like you can see things that are beautiful in nature. In the wilderness, by the way, you go to the wilderness, see something that's very beautiful. He didn't see something that was beautiful. He saw something that was supernatural, mm. right? The second, I want you to already, by the way, be thinking about Mahmoud Harsinai in Shemot 1920, right? Also a place that's outside of human sovereignty. You can't go up the mountain, right? Also a place where what you're going to see is supernatural. Right, the first two psukim that we learn about it. Great. Vayomer Moshe. So Moshe says, Asura na ve'er'et amare agadol azeh. I want to see it. Madolo yivaras na. Why isn't this thing burning? Vayar Hashem kisar lerot. So God sees that he stops off to see this thing because it is supernatural. Vayikra elav elokim ito chasne. And God calls from within that bush. Vayomer Moshe, Moshe, vayomer ineni. Moshe says, Right? So this is a place where God talks, God speaks. Clearly, we see that too. And then something new. Vayomer, God's response to Moshe is, Alti krav halom, don't come any further. Stop, limit, pause, line. Shal na'alecha me'al raglecha, take your shoes off. Ki yamakom asher atahu made alav admat kodeshu. Because this place is sacred ground. I don't want you to come here. I don't want you, I want you to stop. I want you to feel the limitation, right? And then Moshe does something very interesting. Vayomer, God continues to speak. Anochi, eloke avicha, eloke avram, eloke yitzchak, eloke yaakov. Vayaster, Moshe panav, ki yare mehabit el elokim. And Moshe stops looking, right? He came here because he wanted to see something. And then when he got there, he realizes, ooh, there's nothing, I'm not supposed to see anything here. I'm gonna hide my face, right? So we have in composite the first time we meet Chorev, the first time we meet Sinai. We have a place that's outside of human sovereignty and maybe even human habitation. Seems like God's in charge here. We have a place where what you see, if anything, is going to be supernatural. We have a place that's going to set limitation on human ability to participate. And we have a place that actually, in the end, the revelation of it is don't look. It's what we call an iconic. There's no icon associated. There's nothing we want you to see. And as we actually go through the Chumash, these themes appear over and over again when it comes to Sinai and in very specific ways. So look, for example, at Shemot Yudtet, okay? I want us to notice that what showed up in Shemot Gimel as you know, don't come any further. Stop where you are. I'm putting a limitation on you. Becomes a whole characteristic way that the covenant works between God and humanity, right? Ve'ata, we're in Shemot Yotet, Pasakei, for those listening. Ve'ata im shamoa tishmu'u b'koli. 
Ushmartem et briti vitem li skula mi kol I don't know where the cuff went. Kili kol haaretz. Also, the cuff disappeared. It's like Bible codes. I don't know what's going on, right? And if you listen, to, if you heed my voice and you keep my covenant, then you're going to be my treasured possession from among the nations, because all of the earth is mine. What does the im add to the conversation that we've seen in Shmot Gimel about what Sinai is? The if you listen. Conditions. Yeah, I meaning it's not just take your shoes off. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you limitations. It's this whole aspect of the relationship between God and the Jewish people is I'm going to tell you what to do. And if you do it, im, if you do it, I got you. And if you don't do it, If you don't do it. So I was sitting a few years ago with some Muslim leaders at our Muslim leadership initiative at Hartman. And a few of them, I was supposed to teach about chosenness. And it was a tough day to teach about Jewish chosenness or, you know, Amskula. It was a tough day to teach about it because it was a day that Al-Aqsa was closed to visitors. And a lot of the Muslim leadership initiative people who come to be at Hartman and learn about Jewish nationalism one of the ways that they can justify the fact that they're going to Israel is that they get to go to Al-Aqsa. So I was basically facing a room full of people on their first day who weren't allowed to go to Al-Aqsa and aren't supposed to teach about Jewish chosenness, which is like not, the, not my favorite. It wasn't, it wasn't a great situation. So like we spoke, about, we spoke about two different approaches to Jewish chosenness. We talked about Rabbi Yehuda Levy's approach, which is more mystical, more inherent, more imminent, right? We talked about, well, I, I, don't, I don't hide anything. We talked about the Rambam, which is more about a sense of responsibility. And we talked about the political ramifications of the differences between those two, as Micah has already, I, I see on his face, right? But somebody raised her hand and she said, I, I don't even understand. I don't even understand how you think you're the chosen people. Like you've messed up so much. Hasn't God just rejected you? Because that's what we've learned. And I was like, well, that's also what Christians learn. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And we were talking about it. And I said, well, actually, no, no, no. We, we, have, um, we have a promise that's la'olam. It's, it's forever. You know, when God's angry at us, we just have to go into exile. And what I realized is that that promise doesn't come from here. Brit Sinai over and over again seems conditional in a way that if you don't do it, you're out. You're out. Yeah, it's right. right? That is the way that Brit Sinai is pushed. And I want to I, I wanna point something out, which is, remember how we also mentioned that there's this weird question of how much can Moshe look and see and how much does he say, oh, there's nothing to see here. I want us to notice that over and over again in the Chumash, when we talk about Sinai and Brit Sinai, the word Riya, sight, is usually something that is mentioned only either with regards to, you saw some supernatural sights, right? You could, you could see certain sounds, or to negate the idea that you could see God, God's self. Wow. So instead of ri'iyah for revelation, what do you have here in this Pasuk? It's shmi'ah, hearing, mm. listening, right? That is actually the active sense of revelation, the active sense is not sight. What you see with your eyes, okay, you see something supernatural like a light show, but you don't see God, right? The whole point, right, if you look at Dvarim for a second, Dvarim Dalid, which is on um, number four, right, the whole point of maybe you could argue the, the light show, right, the light and sound show, is that you're not actually going to see God at all. Right? You can't see God at all. And that's in four. Vinishmartim Odlin Aftertechem, Perak Dalit and Dvarim, Pasuk Tedvav. Vinishmartim Odlin Aftertechem, be very careful. Ki lo reitem kol tmuna biyom dibera shem alechem bechorev mitocha ish. You heard God. You didn't see God. I want you to remember because what are we worried about? We're worried that you're going to look at nature and you're going to assume that nature is God. Right? So it has to be listening, hearing, and it's conditional. This is what we are supposed to do. It's our human responsibility. And of course, the people pick up on this back in number two. And when they pick up on this, what they say in Pasuk Chet is, 
okay, got it. Vaya'anu kol, the cuffs are just gone. Vaya'anu kol ha'am yachdav. Vayomru kol asher diber Hashem na'ase. Vayashev Moshe divrei ha'am el Hashem. Right? It's very clear. We got it. We're supposed to do certain things. That's what Brit Sinai is really supposed to be about. Now, I will say that if you look beyond Chumash and you look, you know, one place that I really love to look for just a different way that the Tanakh is going to look at something is Tehillim. Because Tehillim doesn't situate itself in any one story, but will give a lot of cosmic stories about what's going on in the breach between God and the Jewish people. So I want you to just look for a second at Tehillim Samech Chet Pasuk Tet in number five, okay? The way that the revelation at Sinai is described, right? Eretz Ra'asha, you have an earth that's trembling. Af Shamayim Natfu, the sky rains in the desert. Right? So some people actually, as they explain this, they say it's almost like the sky was sweating. Like, oh, God is coming. Mm. The sky is sweating, right? Like supernatural yeah. things. It's not, you know, they see a big monsoon in the middle. I mean, I'm, I'm no meteorologist, right? But so why were, why were all these things happening? Mipnei Elohim, because of God. Zesinai, by the way, Zesinai means God is Sinai. Sinai is God. Mipnei Elohim, Elohei Yisrael, because of God. We were, it was scary, right? And this is why when you said an accessible, I was like, ah, uh, I have questions, right? Is it, a, is it an accessible place or is it a scary place? It's a place where human beings who have, we have senses, we're basically not supposed to look at anything or what we do see completely defies our senses. We're told you can't walk here, you can't go here. This is the condition. If you do this, great. Implicitly, if you don't, Bye-bye, see you later, right? And it's God's place. It's not human politics. It's not human. But I will say, Anne, that Chazal went your route, if you look at number three. The Mechilta de Rabbi Yishmael, and I think it's really interesting, and it's a, it's a, I actually think it's a minority thread within the way that Chazal look at, at Sinai, but in this situation, they're looking at Sinai and they're saying, oh, why is it in a, why is it in a midbar? Why is it in a wilderness? Well, I'm saying it's outside of human sovereignty to basically say God's in charge and human beings are not in charge. They're going to say radically accessible, right? No borders. So let's take a look at number three. They camped in the midbar. The Torah was given in a place of demus is like uh, demography, like demos, like population, big populations. Farhesia in public, in a place that is hefker. Nobody owns it. In the Midbar, right? So I'm saying that's because God is owning it and you're all, you all have to do what you have to do, right? And Chazal are softening it a little bit. She'ilu nitna Torah be'eretz Yisrael, or she'ilu nitna be'eretz Yisrael, had it been given in Israel, hayom rim le'umot ha'olam, e'en lahem chelek ba. We would have said to the non-Jews, we would have said to the um, nations of the world, you have no chelek in this. But lefichach nitna be'midbar, dimos farhesia be'makom hefker. Therefore, it was given in the Midbar in a way that is radically accessible. Nobody really owns it. And anybody who wants to come take it can come take it. Now, I don't know if this is saying people can come convert. I don't know if it's talking about the seven mitzvot of B'nai Noach. I don't know if it's this like radically interesting thread that goes through Chazal in some ways that is like a person who learns Torah who's not Jewish is just as good as a Kohen Gadol. Could be any one of those three. I'm not so interested in resolving that for now. But what I am interested in is I'm actually pushing in a very different direction in terms of what we see Tanakhically about the Midbar. The Midbar is not like radically open. It's human beings don't own it. God owns it. I say jump, you say how high, and that's the way that this works, right? right? That's sort of, uh, that's, that's the push that I see when I look in Tanakh. Did you have a question about that? I, you wanted to understand which one of those three or, pathways this might be working yeah, on. Yeah, yeah and, and I don't know. Jonathan, were you going to say something? I just saw you. Uh, great. Let's look at Britzio, uh, okay? Now, there are people, including Levinson, who just want to start Britzion from the Davidic dynasty. I do not want to start Britzion from the Davidic dynasty. And the reason why I don't want to start Britzion from the Davidic dynasty is because I think that the roots of Britzion are just like when Moshe goes to Chorei for the first time, you can see a lot of the themes. 
I think the first time that God talks to Avraham about Tzion is it gives us some roots, some themes that are going to be in tension with the themes of I say jump, you say how high. This is a place that's radically outside of human political sovereignty. This is a place that, you know, pushes limitations. There's nothing for you to see here. Anything you see here is supernatural. I actually think Brizion pushing in a completely other direction, like actually intention in a way. And I want to see it. I want to feel it a little bit. So let's look at Brizion. Six. We're in Breshit Perikud Gimel, Pasuk Yudalid. I can't read all of these. It's too, it, the pedagogy is too bad. I can't do it. Even if for the recording, it's better. Could somebody please read? Okay, I can't sit in front of a bunch of people. You don't want to hear me s- recite 17,000 sources. Yes, please. John, you said your name is? Yeah, yeah go for it, John. Please. Um, and the Lord said to Abram, after Lo had parted from him, raise your eyes and look after where you are, to the north and south, the east and west. Okay. Tell me, what do you know about Brizion? What do you know about Brizion first? It's, it's not just a place. It's what sense are you using? Sight. Sight. There's plenty to see here. If the revelation at Sinai, you either th- see things are, that are supernatural, or when it comes to God, if you can't see God, you're going to listen to God, and you're probably also going to use your what? Brain. Your. Right. If you're not going to use your physical sense. You're going to use your imagination, imagination, right? Meaning if Sinai is a place of imagination, you're going to hear, but you also kind of have to imagine, right? So you have the light show and it's helping you and the sounds and it's helping you imagine like what's going on, right? This is a place where, no, just open your eyes. Just look. It's right here. I'm not worried that you're going to think that God is in the trees. You can look. This is a place of revelation that you can actually see. Right, and I want you to see it. And over and over again, when it comes to Brit Zion, as opposed to Brit Sinai, which is shmiya, 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 hearing, 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 listening, 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 Brit Zion is riya, riya, riya. Look, 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 look. Okay, yeah, Rabbi Fleischman. There's also kind of an openness, of like look out in every direction, like boundless. So I think the boundlessness is also going to speak to what happens in the next pasuk. Let's look at pasuk 15, Tedvav. For I give all the land that you see to you and your offspring forever. Okay, what, what kind of covenant is this? If Brit Sinai is, I'm going to tell you what you have to do, who has responsibilities in Brit It's not a It's just a gift. Just Hashem. It's unconditional. God. God has the responsibility. It is a gift, not a demand, right? God's not demanding anything of us right now. It's a gift. I'm going to give it to you. And by the way, to Rabbi Fleischman's point, it is so expansive. It's like, here, you can have it all, right? And why do you say it's unconditional, Anne? Because there's no requirement on the part of, of Abraham. Good. And look at the end of Pasuk Tetvav. Ad olam forever. Right? There's no im. There's no if. It's forever. Right? By the way, the reason why Levinson, sorry for one second, the reason why Levinson wants to start with the Davidic dynasty is because as you're going to see in Tehillim, God promises David, he's going to be like the Shemesh, he's going to be like the sun, he's going to be, he, it's going to be forever. The roots of that are right here. They're right here, right? It's very, very different. Yes. Be difficult. Uh, that's what I'm looking I mean, I for. Hear this. This, you hear it. This, this you should see this part. Put this way, and it's really it right on. However, when you say it's not conditional, I get that, but there's all this stuff. If you don't shape up, I'm kicking you out of the land. But Beautiful. I'm vomit you up. Beautiful. This is the beauty of pulling things apart, pulling threads apart. The thread of Brit Zion says, you will always have this place. You may have to go into exile and then you'll come back, uh-huh. but you will always, you cannot lose it. Uh-huh. You don't get that from Sinai. You get that from Zion. And remember, I'm doing it in the order of Sinai to Zion, but the Torah does it in the order of Zion right. to it's Sinai. Right. You start with a gift and then you're told what to do. The reason why I'm doing it in the other way is because I actually think the, the differences stand out in a bigger way when I do it in this order. That's the only reason I'm doing it the way. But think about what it means to have a relationship where you're given a gift first and then you're told, Okay, in order to keep this gift, this is what you're supposed to. So we're going to talk about the relationships between it. Let's do one more Pasuk for a second, and then Anne, we'll get to your point. Okay, look at Pasuk. uh, 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 
we'll continue in Pasuk Tetzayin, V'samti at Zarecha Kafar Haaretz, Asher, Im Yuchal Ishlim Note at Afar Haaretz, Kam Zarecha Yimane, I'm gonna, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna have a lot, a lot, a lot of progeny, you know, which for any woman who's ever been pregnant is like, whoa, that's a lot, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> Pasuk Yedzayin, Pasuk Yedzayin, well, Pasuk Yedzayin, Kum Hitalech Baaretz, oh, come on. Now, Orka Uli what what is happening here? Ki et nena. I, this Pasuk, I want you to think split screen. Moshe is told when he gets to a place that's holy, what is Moshe told at Sinai? Boaz, this is for you. What is he told? Take your shoes off. Don't stop. Don't walk. Avraham, when he's supposed to go somewhere that's holy, is told what? Go everywhere. Put your shoes on. Oh we're, great. we're taking a walk. Oh, that is. I can never not see those next to each other because they speak to the idea that one of them is restriction, 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 condition, 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 God in charge, God in charge, God in charge. And the other is gift, gift, gift. It's not just about fear and restriction. It's actually about allowance and sovereignty and engagement with a very physical, very seeable, very touchable place. Anne. Well, this is maybe to state the obvious about your conflict, that when you say the children of Avram, which children are you referring to? So Avram's chosenness. Right. Well, so it's actually interesting. When you get a few prakim later, you actually see, I think it's Perakud Zion, you actually see coming to life this sense where Hashem says to Avram, you're gonna, Sarah's gonna have a kid. And Avram says, Lu Yishmal I just want Yishmal to live. God says, that's not what's gonna happen. And then God says, I want you to give a bris to your progeny that's coming. And Avram gives a bris also to, uh-huh. to Yishmael, right? Meaning there's something going on there in the choosing. I think for a different shear, yeah. but I think at the very least, the stakes are very, very high right? Because it's a gift and it's not a requirement. So who's going to get that gift, and, right? And Hagar could have been one also. I mean, Ralph Silver, this is Ralph Silver. Yeah. yeah. That Hagar, when she was in, when she was exiled, she, she didn't want to accept the burden of the grit, of, of the suffering. And, I mean, it's she interesting. had a moment when she could have. That That's interesting. A possibility. Yeah, I'd she have to look at... She already had Gare, she already had the exile part down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's very interesting. I'll have to look that up. That, that's very interesting. So she, there was a moment, but yeah. she decided not to take that moment. That's very, very interesting. The way that it ends in Pasuk Yudchet, in this particular source, in number six, is then Avram, of his own accord, builds a Mizbeach to God. Right? God didn't say, this is what you have to do. He was feeling like, oh, a gift. Thank you so much. A gift. And that also, the idea that what we're experiencing here is actually a visible revelation. That's what I'm actually going to call the land of Israel. That it is a visible revelation of the breed of the covenant between God and the Jewish people in a way that Sinai could never be that visible revelation, right? And I think there's a reason why we don't go shalosh regalim to Sinai, Right? Do you know what I mean? Meaning, I think it's actually kind of interesting in yesterday's parasha to notice that they're supposed to rewrite the Torah right when they go over the Jordan River. It kind of makes you feel like they're trying to move Sinai into the land of Israel. Right? But it's not, but it's not a revelation. But it's not a revelation, right? Meaning the revelation that they got is in a place that Dafka can't be a place that human beings own. And it can't be a place that you can see. And it can't be a place where it's just a gift, right? It has to be a place that imposes restrictions. It has to be a place that challenges human sovereignty, right? You need, you actually need both sides of this. I want to show you another really beautiful articulation of this kind of sense that Sion is a, it's, it's a revelation that you can see in front of your eyes in a way that Sinai is not. Tehillim Memchet is just a beautiful Tehillah in general. But some people suggest that it is like a sacred topography because what it does is it describes the beauty of Israel, the beauty of Zion. And it seems that over the course of the Perek, it mentions at different, at different points, it mentions different 
north, east, south, west, mm -hmm. like all the directions. So if you look, for example, at Pasuk Gimel in number seven, Yefei nof misos kol haaretz, har tzion yarketei tzafon kiryat melech rav, right? It is, it has a beautiful nof. It has a beautiful landscape, right? And it is the Mount Zion, which is at the Tzafon, actually. It's at the north. And then you go to Pasukhet, talking about how God's power is felt and enemies are terrified as an easterly wind. Chet, ruach kadim, beruach kadim teshaber on yot tarshish, right? An easterly wind. And then what I think is more fun is Pasuk Yud Aleph, okay, which is Kishimcha Elohim Kain Tihilatcha Al Katzve Eretz Tzedek Mala Yiminecha, right? That God, you are beneficent, you are righteous. But the word Yiminecha, some readers say, ah, also a veiled reference, Binyamin, South, which is beautiful. Like it's just beautiful. And then towards the end, right? If you look in um, uh, uh, Yud Gimel to Ted Vav, it really emphasizes this aspect of this is something you can see. So Sion v'hakifua sifru migdalea, walk around Sion and encircle it, right? Count how many towers it has. Shitulibchem lechela, check out its ramparts. Pasku armenotea, leman tisapru ledor acharon. Go through its citadels so that you can tell a future age. Now, some people, again, it's just they're looking for all of the four directions. There are places in Tanakh where Acharon actually means what's the only direction we have left? West. West, right? Which is kind of interesting. But here's the kicker. Pasuk Tevav. Kize Elohim. What? Someone explain that to me. What does that mean? Yeah. Um, I would argue this, this may be a little bit of my own thoughts, but I think it's a little maybe subversivist that you may think that this is all, um, that our legacy is this whole topography, but God is forever and he'll lead us all the time, even outside of it. Ah, so you want to go and say, because this is really God, so don't get too attached, right? Yeah. And this is Eloheinu, God is our God, Olam, olam Va'ed forever. Huinagenu almut, which some people think almut is like um like olamot, yeah. like forever. Yeah. Okay, great. Other reads. I mean, the opposite. I mean, this is God right here, right now. No yep. Else. Yep. Right. The what's beautiful about this ending is that it basically says, "Look around. This is God, not literally God, but." But, well, because we're talking about the Tanakh, right? It doesn't really think it's literally God. But this is God's work, right? Meaning God brought you here to see this. Don't, right? And at the same time, it's obviously not just about a place. Because if it's about God, then it's about God. And we've learned that God is not just about a place. How right? come it's Makom? Right? How come God is Makom? <laughs> right? Hamakom. Uh, but let's remember, that's rabbinic. Yeah. That's not biblical, right? You're right. I mean, well, that I think is a is a fair yeah, question. The anthro the anthropomorphism I think is a is a great question. I can't tell you. I mean, there's a new Tehillim JPS Tehillim coming out in a few months. Let's see what they do with this. Let's see what they do with this. No, it's actually going to be really quite good. Uh, let's see what they do with this. But what I think is kind of interesting is you've got kind of Zesinai, right, and Zetzion in a way, and they really are pushing in different directions. And I could totally see. I, I actually want to add a moral valence to the idea of Tzion. Because you could just say, okay, Tzion, very nice. You gave us a gift. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. I see much more in Sinai a moral valence. You have to do this. You have, you're just giving me a present, Adolam, even, though, even if I'm terrible, right? I want to talk for a second before we get to, okay, then what becomes the relationship between Tzion, which is a gift, and Sinai, which tells us this is what you have to do, Right? But before we even get there, I want to talk about the strength of having a place, the power of having an actual place, a physical space. What does it look like if you have a revelation and a covenant that is only based on Sinai? What does it look like if you have a revelation and a covenant that's only based on seal? 
I think either of them is actually missing something. But I want to talk for a minute. Check out number eight, Maurice Helwax. I don't know why we don't learn about him in school. If somebody could explain that, I would be very happy to know. Was he anti-Semitic or something? That's probably the answer I'm going to get. Strike that from the recording. I mean, he's a French philosopher, so chances are. Sorry, but true. Yeah. I took a class where he was a major part of the reading. That's awesome. So it'll be interesting if you have something that you want to add. So Maurice Halbwax is the guy who is the, the French philosopher who is credited with coming up with the idea of collective memory which is a pretty significant idea in our world. And so he's talking a bit about space and collective memory, and I find it very uh, profound, actually. Would somebody read it, number eight? He's going to quote Comte. Comte is the founder of positivism, which essentially, okay, listen, if you're a religious person, it's very hard to be all in on positivism. Positivism is, it's not here until, unless you can touch it or see it or feel it or push it or whatever it is. O- obviously, religious people, we, we hope and pray to something that is beyond the physical. But nonetheless, it does focus us somewhat on the significance of something you can see. He died in Buchenwald. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness, scratch that from the record because that's disgusting. Maurice Halbwax. He's looking him up. Yes. Uri, I need your help. Listen to this. Listen to this. We just literally, we just literally did the worst thing possible. Maurice Halbwax. No, I did the worst thing possible with making assumptions. That's terrifying. Thank you for looking that up. We don't, we're going to find out. But yes, Anne, please read number eight. He protested the arrest of his... So let's, let's come clean. Maurice Halbwax was a Hasid umot ha'olam who protested the arrest of his Jewish father-in-law in World War II and was second, sent to Buchenwald as a result where he was murdered in 1945. Well, now, now I think even more reason to learn about this person, All right? A, a, a good thinker and a good person. Yeah, Anne. August Kampf remarked that mental equilibrium Thank was you. first and foremost due to the fact that, phys- that the physical objects of our daily contact change little or not at all, providing us with an image of permanence and stability. They give us a feeling of order and tranquility, like a silent and immobile society unconcerned with our own restlessness and changes of mood. In truth, much mental illness is accompanied by a breakdown of contact between thought and things, as it were, an inability to recognize familiar objects so that the victim finds himself in a fluid and strange environment totally lacking familiar reference points. So true is it that our habitual images of the external world are inseparable from ourself, that this breakdown is not limited to the mentally ill. We ourselves may experience a similar period of uncertainty as if we had left behind our whole personality when we are obliged to move to novel surroundings and have not yet adapted to them. Yeah, I think there's something very deep here about the relationship between our sense of self and a place where we find ourselves. And I think the idea of kind of a moral standing to having a brizion that isn't just here I'm giving you a gift, it's actually essentially saying, I am giving you a place that when you come back to it, you feel that you're coming back to yourself. You have an actual place in the world. If Sinai was all there was, Uh we, we, that, Sinai is not a recipe for human stability. Uh Sinai may be a recipe for hearing a, a, a code that you can bring with you anywhere in the world. It is portable. You can have Sinai anywhere in a way, right? But there is significance to the idea that there is an actual place to which you are connected. And when you return to that place, you return to your stable self. Sometimes it's a problem because you forget that anything has transpired in between and that you've changed it all, which, right? Which can be its own issue. But that's what I think has at least my, one understanding of what's actually moral about that, about giving people a place. And it's not just reward, it's it's actually building something. So when I look at Bri, when I look at, only because I'm looking at the time, when I look at Bri Sinai, I see something that gives us the ability to first of all have direction and know what to do, right? To have responsibility, to take responsibility, to recognize that we are not God and that we can take that with us anywhere. If it could be done in the Midbar, it can be done anywhere, right? It's in some way exilic. Right? And then I look at Britzion and I say, Britzion is like the flip side of, that, of the coin. Because Britzion is something that says, 
You don't have to just use your imagination and it doesn't just have to be about the supernatural all the time. And it doesn't have to be that you don't have a place because humans should know that they're not God and they don't rule over everything and that it's just about the conditions. You can have a place where things are actually natural and normal and you can see the experience in front of you in a way that manifests your religious covenant. You can have sovereignty. It's not just God is sovereign. It has to be at the Har Elohim. You can have human harim and human arim and human, right? That kind of thing. And remember that condition that I said at Sinai, what I'm telling you is that even if you don't meet that condition, there's still a home for you here eventually. Even if in the meantime, you have to leave. I wanna do two more things. The first is I wanna look at this uh, chapter in Tehillim, which uh, Tehillim 89, Paytet in number 10, where God talks about David as, I am never going to abandon David, okay? It is wild. It is literally the opposite of what the Chumash says when talking about like yeah. how God wants us to react and uh, how God wants us to act, I should say. Look at, let's just start from Kafalif. Matsati David Avdi B'Shemen. No, come on. I don't know. B'Shemen. Mm. It's, <laughs> it's not it. Somebody want to look it up? No? B'Shemen Kochi. There you go. B'Shemen Kochi Meshachtiv. Right? This is like a good targil. This is a good exercise. Okay? <laughs> I anointed him with my sacred oil. Le'olam eshmor lo chasti uvriti ne'emenet lo. Right? Le, it's really, sorry, le'olam eshmor lo chasti. I am always going to keep my chesed for him. Uvriti ne'emenet lo. My covenant with him shall endure always, always. V'samti la'ad zaro v'kiso ki me'eshamayim. Right, I am going forever, in case you weren't listening, forever, again, right? Keep saying it in different words. This is where it's wild. Im ya'azvu banav torati uvmishvatai lo yelechun. If his children leave my Torah, this is like the opposite of the way that the Chumash would talk, right? A lot of this happens. It's im telechu. We're about to say im b'chukotai lo telechu, right? If they leave my Torah of Mishpatai lo yelechun and they don't walk in my statutes, im chukotai yechalelu mitzvotai lo yishmoru. If they don't keep my Torah, so then what am I going to do? Brit and I would say, get rid of them, they're done. That's not Brit Zion. Uvakadi b'shevet pisham v'nagayim avonam. I will punish them. But v'chasti lo afir meimo v'lo ashaker be'emunati. But I will not leave the 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 fun foundation of our relationship. I will not make myself into a liar. This becomes the foundation for the relationship between Brit Sinai and Brit Sion. What ends up happening is that Brit Sinai and Brit Sion, in some ways, they are independent. Brit Sion, you will always be able to come back here. Remember, Yirmiyahu is getting kicked out of the land, kicked out, and he buys a plot of land because God said, you're coming back. That is insane. What do you mean you're coming back? These people aren't worthy of being here. God says, I don't care if you're not worthy now. You're coming back, right? That's Britzion. Britzinai is, I have to kick you out of here because you're doing the wrong thing and you don't deserve the gift that I'm giving you right now, right? That is how they end up interacting. And when you look in Tanakh, what you find is at least three ways that this expresses itself. And there are more, but at least three ways. One is in telling people to follow uh, ritual actions, okay? We read the Tocha yesterday in Devarim, the Tocha in Vayikra, right? If you're not, I mean, it's literally the same Pasuk in, in number 12. <speaking in Hebrew> If you do my mitzvot, I'm going to give you rain. You're going to be able to stay in the land. Da, 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 da. And if not, I'm going to kick you out. Right? So you have to follow what God has told you to do. And then you have in Nevi'im, we know what we have in Nevi'im. In Nevi'im, it's a little bit less about following the mitzvot ben adam l'makom. A little bit more about following mitzvot ben adam l'chavero. Right? So I think this Pasuk is very 
um, is very, very strong. If you look at number 13, Yirmiyahu 7, Hadavar asher ayal Yirmiyahu me'et Hashem lemor, this is what God said, Amod b'shar beit Hashem, stand at the gate of God's house, v'karat Hashem et hadavar hazeh, and say this, v'amarta say, shim'u devar Hashem, el Yehuda haba'im kol Yehuda, haba'im basha'arim ha'ela lishtachavot la'ashem. You're going to come. Why do you come to the Mikdash? You come to use what sense? What sense are you using of your five senses? Hearing. When you come to the Mikdash? Oh, I'm see. Yeah, you're, gonna, you're coming to see. Everybody's coming to see. They're going to come to see. We have the busy Mikdash. And he says, I don't want you to see. I want you to listen. Oh. I, I, we have a little Sinai uh, 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 tone that we want to have here. Right? This is what God says. Okay, Israel. You want to stay here where you can see the revelation? Then you have to do the right thing. But don't you believe in yourselves from lies? Lemur saying, Look, but we have God's house. But look, look what we have. How is it possible? If we have these things, how is it possible that we could be doing the wrong thing? You say, no, 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 invert your, op- invert your order. Listen, and then what you see is actually stable. If you think what you see is what's stable, without having to listen, you have a big problem. And then you have in Tehillim kind of the individualized version of uh, doing the mitzvot, both ben adam l'chavero and ben adam l'makom, right? It's sort of, you know, mi agor ba'olecha, mi ishkon bahar kochecha, who's allowed to go into God's house, which sounds on more of an individual level. You have to be like this and you have to be like that, right? Fine. I want to share with you to close, um, I want to share with you to close a keynote that I found this summer that was written, it's in the Cairo Gniza, right? So sort of the trash heap of the Middle Ages, um, the Gniza, the Shamos of the Middle Ages. But uh, uh, there's a kina that was written for the 17th of Tammuz, for Shiva Sarba Tammuz. Mm. And within it, it just has, I think, a very poignant uh, move pushing the Sinai Tzion uh, relationship. So if you look at number 15, it's just part of it. Amarti b'Sinai anochihu. I said at Sinai, I am God, v'hema b'Tzion, but they in Tzion, ki chashu v'ayim rulohu. And they said, no, you're not. Amarti b'Sinai, in Sinai, I said, lo yalcha lo himachirim apanai. I don't want you to have other gods. But Vehema Bitzion, but they in Zion decided that they were going to put a uh, um, uh, image. image, thank you, before me. Amar Di Bisinaya said, Lotisel Hashem, La Shavat Shem, don't use God's name in vain. Vehema Bitzion, Chililu at Hashem. And it goes through all of the Ten Commandments, which I think essentially what they were ba- what's basically being said here is, and I'm going to go back to that conversation that I had with that Muslim leader, where I said, by the way, without, without Bitzion, that would be it. You'd be right, mm. right? You'd be right. And so I want to think for a minute, just from like a moral standpoint, what it means to be a Jew who is lopsided, okay? Because I think that it is very easy to be lopsided. If somebody spends all their time in the Brit Sinai, uh-huh. right? Like, or the reform movement kind of did that when they said Zion is necessary. So I think there are a lot of ways that you could end up being only in Brit Sinai, right? One way to only be in Brit Sinai is to be focused solely on the God's in charge and human beings are, we're going to sneak away, right? Sort of like an anti, sort of like an anti-Zionist kind of situation. One way to only be involved in Brit Sinai is to actually do what the Mechilta basically said, which is, oh, we're universalists. That's what we do. That's what we are. Right? We just we forget about place, right? I would add another way to be only Brit Sinai is to actually think that politics have no place in religious life. <laughs> I, I, I'm just saying, meaning I think like human beings shouldn't have power and you like I think there are a lot of ways. Now, if you're only a Brit Sion Jew, then first of all, where's the imagination? How do you do it outside of the land? Where is God's sovereignty over your sovereignty? Mm-hmm. Where are your limitations? Right? Power makes right. Yeah, that's clear, right? So I really think, and I, I'm just going to be, I'm going to be straight about this. I do not think that American Jews who are Zionists, okay? 
I don't think we have a religious language for talking about these questions of how do you mix Brit Sinai and Brit Sion. You don't think religious Zionism is adequate? I, I think in America, because we're, we're not sitting there, we're not on the front lines and figuring out how to use your power and how you have a, right? Right, right, right? And I kind, I really do wonder like what it looks like today to talk about in religious terms, to talk about what the relationship between Brit Sinai and Brit Sion should be today. And I'll, I'll say, I'm gonna say exactly what I mean by this because I, I don't really mince words, which is great I, for me, but I don't know if it's good for other people. No, I'm saying I feel very com- like, you know, calm about that. If I were so calm about that, would I have to say that? I don't think so. I don't think so. But I guess here's what I would say. It's very clear from the Chumash and from the Tanakh what Brit Sinai you have to keep in order to stay in Sion. It's very clear. It tells you, you're going to treat the poor nicely. You're going to keep Shemitah. You're going to... My big question is, if the gift of Eretz Yisrael is predicated upon us fulfilling our responsibilities, I need to understand if there are new responsibilities in the 21st century that the, that, that the Tanakh does not talk about. Oh, meaning, you're saying, of course, but I actually think it's a deep conversation that people are very nervous about having because we all have politically different approaches to what that looks like. But I do think, like in a way, I don't want to shirk that, right? I mean, I, I don't want to shirk that. And when I look at Brit Sion and Brit Sinai, I don't only think about the responsibilities of like, make sure that Jews aren't below the poverty line in Israel. And I don't always think, only think about make sure that we're keeping Shemitah, though I think about those things too. I also think about like, we have this huge conflict that's going on between Israelis and Palestinians. Like, well, so in a religious, from a religious standpoint and religious language, I actually want us to think about honestly, without killing each other, like actually, which I think is so hard because people really do have different perspectives, but I would like to see some religious engagement with that. Yeah. Like Sinai is, it, Sinai is real, like it's, it's real. And it's, it's, once you bring it into Eretz Yisrael, it's outside of the walls of Shul. And you got to figure out how to deal with that. And I, and I, I don't know exactly what to do, maybe. And I, I want to make one programmatic suggestion because I'm being recorded. I think one way that could be really interesting is if we spend more time actually learning about some of the debates, even within both religious Zionism in Israel, but not just religious Zionism, also some of the Jewish and democratic state debates that have taken place in Israel. Like, I think there's a lot, a lot of material there that we either avoid or we don't know it's there. And I would love to see us doing more about it because I, I'm not saying this as like, I really mean this. Like when I give this sheer, I say to myself, okay, what's the Sinai stuff that we're supposed to be doing? What's the responsibility? Because we have to be worthy of a place in order to keep it in our religion. Okay, I'm going to pause that. I'm going to pause there. Yeah, question, comments, and then let's, everybody should go to lunch. You must yeah. have come across Yeshayahu Abbas. Yeah. He has yeah. he has some interesting takes on yeah. this whole thing. And like he makes me crazy cuz some when he's good, he's unbelievably good, and when sometimes he gets a little crazy. But he's okay, got but, a lot to say about this. But you have to remember, comments. if you want to be able to have a conversation where people aren't going to necessarily agree with each other, yeah. You can't just bring Yishayah Leibovitz, right? Well, because he's you, sitting right? in a very particular place, no, I totally right? Like, Rav Sha'ul Yisraeli. Like, there's a really important literature on this that I just don't think we're dealing with. And I think it's a real problem. Religiously, I think it's a real problem. Yeah. Because then Israel, the Brit Zion just becomes nationalism. Yeah. Who cares? Well, we're not, yes, we have something much deeper than that. It's a break between Hashem and the Jewish people. What are we doing about that? Yes, you Did you want to say something, Sarah? What do you think we should do? I, I think, so I actually think a great uh, um, Tchumen, which is um, the religious Zionist, um, religious Zionist journal that's been around for a long time. Um, Tchumen, it's called, and it stands for something. I don't remember what it stands for because I'm bad at things like that. Like Tchum, like a, like a, like a boundary, right? There are, there have been a number of volumes that have actually been dedicated to questions like this, yeah. right? So for example, Tumen 4, the volume, it, that volume is all about um, 
uh, 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 wartime ethics. So if Rav Lichtenstein weighs in, Rav Shaw, like these are, these are people who were actually thinking about these things. I just, yes. you know, and again, you could take this year and be like, oh, I don't want to talk about Israel today. That's your prerogative. I just think like, yeah, it's real. I just think it's real. And I can't teach a Torah that's saying you have to be worthy of a place and then not actually asking what it might mean today. Yeah. Thanks everybody for coming to this year. Appreciate you. So nice to learn with all of you. No, oh, you're the best. And you should read, you should read Levinson, Sinai and Zion. If it's, it's such a thin book and it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's a book and it's, it's a paperback. It's an easy, it's beautiful.